Hello, River Valley Church at home. Uh, thanks so much for connecting with us today. We want this to be a place where you feel like you belong, whether you just belong to our Church at Home family or if you're part of our normal uh, in-person gatherings. Uh, we want that to be a place where you feel connected. Hey, we've been going through this Joy Ride series. What a great journey we've had to the book of Philippians. Hopefully you've been encouraged as the ups and downs, the roller coaster that Paul had in his life, and he shared us as we kind of walked through that together. Well, we're going to look at that today as we finish up the book and talk about generosity, as Mark shares with us through the end of chapter 4. But before we do, here's some more in our River Valley Weekly. Welcome to the weekly. This is Abby. And I'm Adriana. And we have two announcements for you today. Coming up on October 10th at all campuses, we have a church orientation class coming up. And that'll allow you to get any questions you have about the church, learn more about how our church works and what we believe in, and also meet any of our church leaders. And for more information on this class, just look in your program. Hello, single ladies. This one is for you. October 23rd, we're having an oil change and a light car maintenance at the downtown campus. Details for this is in your program, or you can register online. That's all the announcements we have today. Thanks for joining us. And, and have, have a, a great, great week. <laughs> every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Do what's best for you. That's our title today. Have you heard that statement recently? Maybe somebody said, you got to do what's best for you, man. Or you said, yeah, I just got to do what's best for me. Like, how do you feel about that statement? How did, it, how did it sound to you when you heard that statement? Now, some of you may have thought, great, good for you. You need to take care of you, right? Like, if I don't look out for me and if you don't look out for you, then who will? Others of you, when you heard that statement, you're like, I don't know. Doesn't sound quite right to me to be motivated by like what's best for me. Sounds me-centered, sounds selfish. Well, no matter what you think about that statement, it's popular today. It's some really loud voices. First, internally, we hear that voice inside of us. There's a wiring naturally in us, take care of you, love you, self-preservation, self-interest. We definitely hear these voices loud and clear outside of us. I mean, virtually every mental health or self-help publication, blog, article that you read, pretty much all advertising and marketing, preaches this message, you do you. So here's some titles that I came across. Always do what's best for you. Another one said, how to stop feeling guilty about doing what's best for you. Another one, do what's best for you even when it's not the best for others. Another, do what's best for you and do it to the best of your ability. And maybe you've heard this, be you, do you, for you. There's even a Disney song, believe it or not, always do what's best for you. Apparently, we have to teach kids that, okay, like, like they don't know that already. The great theologian, LeBron James, says this, you have to do what's best for you and what's going to make you happy at the end of the day because no one can live with the consequences or anything that comes with your decision besides you. Do what's best for you. So is it good or is it bad? Like, which is it? Well, you might say, it's a no-brainer. There's no debate at all. From a biblical perspective, it's definitely bad. One verse puts this to rest back in Philippians chapter 2, same book we're in. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not only look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So pretty clear right there, doing what's best for you is not best for you because it's self-serving, it's self-centered. In other words, it's sinful, not the Christian response. But what's interesting, even though uh, that's true, we so often act and think in a self-centered way. Like we know it's not right, but we do it all the time. And like, so why is that? Well, we might say because we have a sin nature. We have a tendency naturally uh, to be selfish. But what if it's more than that? What if we're missing something 
that's really important. Like, like what, if, what if those voices I was just talking about, the, the inner voices that say, do what's best for you, and the outside voices, hey, do what's best for you. Like, what if, what if they're actually on to something? What if, what if they don't go, what if they're true, but they, it's just that they don't go far enough? Like many things that are good and God-given, they've become tainted and sinful. We're going to talk about that. It brings us to our text today. Here, last teaching in Philippians in this Joyride series. Next week, we start in the book of John. We're really excited about that. But here in this last message of Philippians, Paul is going to give us some closure on this issue. Do what's best for you. Good, bad, godly, ungodly. Well, the resolution is addressed here in the first verse, verse 14. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. That's the NIV translation. Most other translations say it closer to this way. You have done well to share in my troubles. So you kind of put all that together. And he's saying here, it was good of you. And I think we could also say it was good for you. Good of you, good for you to do what? To share with me. To share with me. And then Paul further develops this truth here in verse 15. He says, moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. So he says clearly the thing I'm most excited about wasn't just your gift that you gave to me. I mean, that was great, but I was really excited that it got credited to your account. That is a crazy statement. Paul's talking about there's a big reward for you coming. There's an account somewhere that your sharing has gone to. It's not just what you did for me. It is stored up somewhere. Do what's best for you by sharing, by being a giver. This is how we reconcile this tension. Doing what's best for you. I mean, if what we mean by that is look out for your own interests, put yourself above others, look out for number one, well, then that's a lie we must reject. It's a dead end. There's no joy there. But if we mean do what's ultimately best for you by sharing with others, then that's a good thing and something to be motivated about. Paul makes it really clear in another verse, 2 Corinthians 8.10, and here is my advice about, and I put it in caps, what is best for you? He says, last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. So Paul is tying that phrase, do what's best for you, to giving. Your heart for giving and the need to complete that work. So our big idea, pretty simple, do what's best for you. What, it, what we mean is, is to share. What's best for you is to share. Acts 20. Verse 35, Paul says, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. If you have a Bible with the red letters that show Jesus' words, this is in red letters. And it's crazy because it's so far after the four Gospels. So if you look in the four Gospels for where Jesus said that, it's not there. This was put in later in the sense that, hey, the gospel writers missed this. We got to get it in the Bible because it's that huge of a statement. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Man, how we need to hear that. I need to be reminded of that, right? In other words, do what's best for you and give. Be a contributor. It's like that feeling at Christmas where, you know, the most joy you get is when someone's opening your gift to them, right? Yeah, you guys know how that goes. And that's even, it's way better than the presents that we open. John Piper, a well-known author and pastor, he wrote a book called Desiring God. 
And then he, he wrote a small version that I really like uh, of the same book called The Dangerous Duty of Delight. And in it, he argues biblically that it's our duty to seek pleasure, but to do that the right way and to delight in the Lord and following his ways. He actually calls it Christian hedonism so that we should pursue our best when it comes to joy and pleasure. And the way we do that, the way we get there, to do what's best for us is to do what's best for others. And Paul gives four reasons here in this passage why the best thing for you and me is to share. Number one, he says, it makes you a true lover of people. Verse 14, again, you shared in my troubles. That communicates love like nothing else. When we step into the needs, into the troubles that people have and love them practically through giving, oh, that's huge. I was at Fred Meyer and I'm shopping. This is maybe a couple months ago. And uh, man, I ran in, I think I ran into like half a river valley there. I was there quite a while. Anyway, I ran into this one couple and I hadn't seen them in a while. They've been watching online because uh, of COVID and stuff. And, and uh, we just got talking about how things are going and uh, some projects around the house and whatnot. And I said, man, I got this tore up deck on the front of my house. I tore it up because there's a huge crack. I had to get all the cement out of there. I can't get anybody to come out to finish this thing. I don't know how to lay pour concrete. Or anything. No one, I mean, they won't call me back. They won't show up. And this guy says, I'll do it. And he reminds me, he is a contractor and he knows how to do this stuff. And, and he's, like, he's like, and I'm not going to take any money. He goes, just buy the concrete. And I'm telling you, you don't know what that did. I mean, I can't even, I got this tore up front porch. All my guests have to come in the back, you know. And praise God that I, I just felt such joy, you know, that he did that for me. Brian is a man in our church, and his story is so powerful. Uh, listen to this video now. Every time I smiled, I always felt kind of like, you know, I just didn't have a nice smile. My name is Brian Omer. I've been a part of River Valley since 2006, and um, I've been raised in a Christian family all my life. Ever since I was a little kid, I just never was good at taking care of my teeth. I know that people, when they talk to you, they're, they look face to face with you. And so a lot of times while you're looking and talking to them, they're also can see what your mouth looks like too. The doctor looked at my mouth, she said, there's no way to save them, they all have to come out. When you hear the doctor says they're gonna to have to all come out, it's just kind of like, ugh. I was kind of nervous about the whole thing. It's a lot of money. Then I said, I'm just gonna to have to start setting money aside from my paycheck. The big encouragers in my life were my parents and myself. And also, I spent a lot of time talking to God and praying about it too, and that's where I started feeling the peace about doing it. At the church, we had the prayer request cards, and I wrote on a prayer request, um, if you can please pray for me, because I'm trying to save money for my teeth. One of the ladies on our prayer team, um, she has a sentiment check, and she's a little bit well off, and so she said that she didn't need it. So she gave it to me, she gave me her check. I have a brown Dodge Dakota that we were trying to sell, and this gentleman came along, and he said that he'd buy it, and so that set that money aside. I got some money from my taxes. I got money from my stuntman check that I got too. One of the um, home groups I was here on Monday nights, um, I went and asked them to say, hey, if you guys can, can you just keep me in your prayers, please, to, about saving money and stuff um, for my teeth? And they said, that sure, no problem. And so the next week after that, they all got together and they're talking to me and, and they gave me an envelope and I looked in there, there was over a thousand dollars in there for my teeth. And I was like, oh, I was shocked. I was just like, wow, wow, this is awesome. I was, I was surprised. I talked to Pastor Mark and his home group and I said, hey, if you guys can, just give me your prayers too. And they were able to help me with a check of 1,500. Another gentleman came along and gave me a couple hundred dollars more 
So I was right at that point where I almost was there, but then my parents gave me a little money to help out and that's how I got the money for it. I am shocked and surprised that I had all these people come together and want to help me out in the first place because this is my fault. I did it to myself. And there's been times where I had to go and pray to God and ask God, God, why? Why would, why would they want to do this? Why would they want to help me out when I just asked for prayer requests? And they, they came in and they just said, we want to help you out, Brian, because you're a good person, you're a brother in Christ. And I'm just like, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you that I have a chance to smile and be happy. What a story, man. The opposite of that is 1 John 3, 17 and 18. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So to say we love people, that almost means nothing. What's the backing? And are we giving? And we have all experienced this, and we know that it's true. And this is why Paul is so excited. He's so thankful for this great church. He actually says, here, you're the only church giving to me. And thank you so much for that. And because of your gift, what's going on here, lots of things. Paul gets supported, which people needed in prison in those days, outside support. But more than that, at the end of Acts, it says that he was able to live in a different prison situation called house arrest probably still pretty bad, still chained to a Roman guard all the time, but it enabled him to take visitors. So he was ministering to people who showed up. And in fact, we, we read this here in verse 21, the brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Who are they? They're the guards chained to Paul who are now Christians. So that's a result of the giving of the Philippian church. So it makes you a true lover of people. Number two, it makes you a true worshiper of God. Verse 18, he says, I'm amply supplied. Now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, love this, they're a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. That's, that's temple language, that's worship language, fragrant offering, uh, sacrifice before the Lord. He's pleased. It's a kind of worship that he accepts because it, it requires all of us. It's, it's, it's not just singing songs, right? It's not just, you know, going to a church. It's like doing something, giving. And so giving's always a win, win, win situation. The receiver wins, the giver wins, and God wins because we're never more like God than when we give. All of you who are parents know this. When you see your kids giving, like they share their lunch, they share their toys, whatever. Oh, man, that's huge. And that's how God feels. You know how you feel? That's how God feels when we are givers. Another way of looking at this is the idea that um, one of the greatest ways to worship is to join God on his mission. God is, is on mission in this world to win people to, to himself. And it's interesting that the way primarily that God's mission uh, is carried forth is through funding that mission, like, like to pay for that mission. I don't know why God asked for it. He definitely doesn't need our money. It's just part of his plan that, that, that we support the mission of God to build his church here in Grants Pass and all over the world. So giving is like one of these great ways to, to be winning the spiritual battle. So we, we know that in war, one of the ways to defeat an enemy is to cut off the supply line. And so that's what, when we stop giving, it cuts off the supply line to the work of God in this world. Matthew 6, 21, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's worship. Right? So it's saying, like, our hearts, if our hearts are with God, we're going to give. But it also says, when we give, our hearts follow. So that, that giving helps produce hearts for God as well. James 1.27, religion that 
God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. That's the real thing. Needy people who are in trouble of some kind. A pastor one time said, we can sing all the songs we want in church, but if we're not giving financially to the Lord, we're just playing games. I didn't really like that when I heard it because he was right. It's true. True worship has a lifestyle behind it. So it makes you truly a worshiper of God. Three, it makes you truly wealthy in heaven. And Paul hits this head on in verse 17. He says, it's not that I desired the gift, but what was credited to your account. I already shared that with you before. In other words, hey, the offering was great, but that's not what I desire most. I want you to be rich. And Paul knows that any money that we give here to God's work to bless people goes ahead, goes to heaven. It's being invested eternally. There's so many verses on this that we, we can't take any money or possessions with us when we die. We all know that. But we can send it on ahead. 1 Timothy 6, 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them who Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they'll lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that's truly life. So, guys, did you catch that? Giving here also lays up treasure for when we go to heaven. Eternal investments so that we may take hold of the life that's truly life here. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 6, 20. It's a command. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So not just is it okay to, you know, to be concerned about ourselves and what's best for us, it's commanded to do what's best for us. And what is that? Sharing and sending it ahead to heaven. Man, there's going to be people in heaven that are filthy, stinking rich, okay? And I don't know exactly what that looks like uh, in heaven, but it's going to be awesome. And they're going to have huge rewards because they were wise investors. Finally, number four, it makes you truly wealthy on earth. By doing best for us and sharing, it makes us truly wealthy here on this earth. Verse 19, my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. My God will meet all your needs. Now, who is he talking to here? It's very important. He's talking to people who are giving. Don't separate that from the context. This is a promise for givers. This is what God does in return. You can never outgive God. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So, so, so simple paraphrase, you give little, you know, for the Grinch, then we ain't going to get much. And, and this isn't just financially. This is, this is holistically in life. Because if those who give much end up receiving and reaping, and we know that that's true, We've all tasted it in some way, we need to taste it in greater ways in our lives. The incredible joy and the true wealth on this earth may not be by the bank account. God's not obligated to bless us in big ways financially. All right, He often will do that. He definitely meets our needs, as we read here. Not our greeds, but our needs. And he, he says here, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The word's hilarious. A giver that's laughing. I love that picture. Just laughing as we're giving because it's so fun. Now, many of us have heard these verses. There's so many more. But we might ask, well, how does this really work? Well, a few years ago, Christian Smith, a professor at Notre Dame, he wrote a book called The Paradox of Generosity. And it's based on tons of research. And here's what they found. The more generous a person is, the more happy, healthy, and the more purposeful in life they are. I'll say that again. The more happy, healthy, 
and purposeful in life they are, more joy, less depression, is tied to people that are givers, that are generous. And what they found is that this is a direct correlation. Like, it's not just that happier, healthy people are better givers. It's that they become happier and healthier because they give. And then in one study, they looked at retired people over a seven-year period. Those who volunteered, they gave time, energy, money, were 30% less likely to die in that seven-year period. So literally, we can shrivel up and die when we don't give. And of course, if it's not physically, literally, it's definitely in too many other areas where we shrivel up and we get small. But when we give, then we come alive. It's built into our wiring. God's, God's rigged it that way. We are meant to extend out, not to turn inward. What they found is these stats doesn't work with periodic, periodic giving. Like a little bit here, a little bit there. I did my serve grants pass last year. When's the next, next year we're going to do? It's, it's not this. It's like consistent, regular is what, is what they found. And get this, they define generosity as people who give 10% of their money or more. Happier, healthier, more friends, better, better, more successful life on average. Amazing. So all this proof that it's good for you, it's the best for you to be someone who shares, no matter what the world may lie to us, our own inner false um, voice that's saying you got to grab and you got to hoard and you got to do it all for yourself. No, do what's best for yourself and be someone who shares. Now, I want to wrap up with this. There's two kinds of giving, biblically speaking. And one is spontaneous giving, very important, that we're open to the Holy Spirit as to the needs that He brings to us. People, especially people that you know in your life group or neighborhood or maybe at work. And you're just able to, to bless them, maybe help them pay a bill, or maybe it's surprise, anonymous, uh, or, or, or whatever. Now, obviously, uh, we should be open to this, but um, we should have discretion as well, right? It's not that we give indiscriminately, because the Bible teaches that we should give with wisdom. And because some people, the worst thing that you can do is to give them money. There are other things that they need instead. One of the things I appreciate about our community, organizations like the Grants Pass Rescue Mission, like our own Lifeline Ministry, meets in our lobby three days a week, and they, they help people, a lot of times not with money, but just with connections or some skills or some resources. And these organizations have a lot of expertise in uh, meeting these needs, but we're not off the hook ourselves. It's that spontaneous giving appropriately that... I know so many of you do at River Valley because I hear stories all the time. The second type of giving is systematic giving. And this is ongoing, regular giving in your church home. If it's River Valley, it should be here. If your church home is somewhere else, it should be uh, there. This is the tithe principle. Of course, the tithe, the tenth, tenth of your income giving to the Lord is taught in the Old Testament. The tithe principle carries over as, as I believe, a lifelong uh, principle as an excellent guideline for us. The heart is the key, not to be legalistic or uptight about it, but that because God is so good to us, we want to give as much as we can to him and his work. Now, why is the systematic giving so good for, for us? Okay. Well, first, it's a way to give as much as possible. It's just proven that the more um, regular and systematic our giving is, over the long haul, the more we give. It's like the 401k principle. But you put in a little bit with each paycheck, and at the end of your career, wow, there's, there's a lot there, right? And so that's the idea with giving. You're like, wait a minute, you're trying to compare, like, my, my giving to, like, a 401k? Absolutely. We're talking about the best investment you could ever give, the only safe investment, the only investment that will last forever, as I just shared in scriptures pr previous here, is sending it to heaven, right? So that... And for yourselves, whatever that all looks like. And so it's a great way to give as much as possible. Also, it's a way for regular weekly worship. 1 Corinthians 16.1. Now about the collection for God's people. 
On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. So that weekly, I'm going to give that, that offering to the Lord as a form of worship. Also as a form of, as first priorities. That's the first fruits principle. That the, the first of our income goes to the Lord. Not leftovers. Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Now, another reason is uh, because while a church, like River Valley or any church, um, no church is perfect in how it handle, handles its, its budget, but, but a church like River Valley, fortunately, we have so much, well, first of all, there's so much going on, and, and there's so many diverse ministries. I could talk for another 30 minutes about all these ministries from the kids uh, you know, marriage and groups and classes and local outreach and helping nonprofits and helping a lot of other churches. We're able to do that here at River Valley and global missionaries. And I mean, I can go on and on and on. And so when we give in this way, you put a dime in the offering, it's diversified. It goes, it's like a mutual fund really for God, where it goes to a lot of different needs in the church. The thing that's really good about giving to a church home that's following the Lord Jesus is, is that there's accountability. There's not like one person who's like calling all the shots and spending all the money. Like at River Valley, there is heavy accountability auditing that takes place inside and external audits. Uh, there's checks and balances. I, I mean, I, I like to say, like, if some, and praise God, this never happened. Hopefully, we pray it never will. If someone wanted to rip off from the inside, it'd be very, very difficult here. And there's accountability about how we come to form and pray about the new budget every year. And so all these things, just want you to, to know that sometimes you put money in the offering plate, and you're like, well, I don't know. Of course, we're not passing the plate anymore. We've got the boxes in the back. But anyway, um, it's like, I don't even know where that goes. I'll tell you, it is diversified into all kinds of great work in this community and in um, this world. And ultimately, what we're saying is, Lord, this is for you. Like, I'm doing this for you. There, I'm not going to get any plaque on the wall. I, I can't even say, like, where it should go. This is all for you. And, 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 and you do with it the way you want. And here's the thing. You will never regret the giving that you give to the Lord. You will never, ever regret that. So this is God's plan, to fund his mission. And it's interesting. I came across this quote by an Alan Redpath. He says this, a certain Christian once said to a friend, our church costs too much money. They're always asking for money and spending uh, money her friend replied in this fashion, a little boy was born into our home. He cost us a lot of money from the very beginning. He needed clothes, medications, toys, even a puppy. Then he went to school and cost us a lot more. Later he went to college and started dating and that cost us a small fortune. But in his senior year, suddenly and tragically, he died. And since the funeral, he hasn't cost us a penny. Now which situation do you think we'd rather have? After a long pause, she continued, as long as this church lives, it will cost us. When it dies for want of support and dries up, it will cost us nothing. A living church has the most vital message for the world today. Therefore, I'm going to give and pray with everything I have to keep our church alive. Friends, we have the answer for the world. We don't say it in an arrogant way. It's just the truth. Jesus is the only answer. Like we might say, cure for cancer, cure for COVID, cures for a lot of other things. Those are important, but, but sin, the cure for sin, forgiveness, eternal life uh, in heaven. Like how could we ever spend too much money in that endeavor, joining with God in his mission? You know, I love it how when Jesus one day was teaching, he's, he's there at the Sea of Galilee. He's got a huge crowd and they all can't hear. So he realizes if he can get further off the water in a boat that they'll hear because of the water amplification. He says, Peter, let me use your boat. Peter like rows him out there. And Peter, and so Jesus starts preaching. After Jesus preaches, he tells Peter, hey, um, row your boat out a little ways, drop down your nets. And, and Peter's like, we fished all night. We didn't catch anything. And Jesus said, just do it. And they did. And their nets filled with fish. And I just love that picture. Like Jesus says, hey, you give me your boat, I'll fill it with 
fish. I, I know you didn't catch anything all night, but trust me, if we give to Jesus, he will, again, not our greeds, but our needs. He will meet those needs as he sees best. It's been said, Matthew 6, 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and then all these things will be added to you. So I, I like to say it this way, that if we, if we put Jesus' house first, he's going to take care of our house. And that's really how, how all this works. Jesus one day was uh, sitting there with his disciples in the temple and they were watching the offering. And a lot of wealthy people were coming and giving, which is great. They should give big and they were giving big offerings. But then Jesus pointed to his disciples as a poor widow came and she dropped in two small copper coins, less than a penny. And Jesus said, do you see what she just did? She just gave more than all of them. Because the rest, they gave out of their wealth. But she gave out of her poverty, all that uh, she had. And I kind of look at that today, not in a guilt trip kind of a way, but, but in a love way, like Jesus still watches the offering. He is so concerned about our hearts. He wants the best for us. Giving is not God's way of raising cash. Like he's pretty rich. Giving is God's way of raising kids. And when we give and when we share, we are most like Jesus. And we're responding to the gift that he has given to us in the gospel, in his salvation for us. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. We can be rich in all the ways that matter because Jesus became poor and he gave it all for us. He gave his very life. I hope you know Jesus as your Savior and, uh, and then follow him as, as a giver. And I also want to remind you this week, here's a small little thing we can all do. Do a spontaneous gift for somebody. Just pray for that opportunity. And in your church home, start being a systematic giver. Start somewhere and begin to give regularly to the Lord. And watch what will happen uh, in God's work and in your life. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this teaching today. Awesome book of Philippians and a great way to close that what's best for us is sharing and giving. In Jesus' name, amen. I know I was encouraged by Mark today, just the idea that we should be generous givers. Would we give uh, in our, our times of plenty and also when we give when maybe it's a little bit harder? But would we be people who give spontaneously? Would we be those people who give systematically, give uh, regularly because we know that there's blessing that comes from it? So uh, would we take and apply those principles to our lives today? Would you come and join us next week as we start uh, through the book of John? Uh, have a great week and see you next time.